So I think I had some pretty interesting thoughts during this stream, but as I have not played Bloodborne itself, I can't really talk about the two in context of one another, and I think I've said everything that I need to say about Bloodborne PSX as a work and technical feat in and of itself. So I'm not going to be streaming more of Bloodborne PSX, I'm just going to let this one session stand by itself. So because I haven't played this yet except for the first couple minutes, and honestly I just love I love the dedication of the sound effects, so uh, let's start. Just like that, that's all it takes. Suddenly, I am seven years old again and playing my first PlayStation. I'm actually gonna tag that back to being in game capture mode because, well, I don't I don't want you guys to see what's on my computer. There's many terrible things hidden in there. So we should be good now. Right, so the, I, as I understand it, the work of a, a solo dev who's basically just doing this for funsies, which is extremely admirable if you ask me. Especially the dedication to how early PlayStation games actually looked and felt. But also, I've never played Bloodborne, so I'm probably going to get brutally blindsided as we go. I think this is all fine. I, um... I have not covered myself with glory when playing um, Soulsborne games blind on live on stream. So, for as much as I love these games and as much as I do find them off uh, off stream, let's just see what happens. Oh yes, pale blood. <laughs> well, you've come to the right place. Yarnum is the home of blood ministration. You need only unravel its mystery. But where's an outsider like yourself to begin? Easy, with a bit of yarn and blood of your own. But first, you'll need a contract. Even the wibbly wobbly polygonal models are accurate to the era, which is astonishingly, astonishingly impressive to me. I really love it. This was um, kind of my introduction to gaming overall, this era of, uh, of games. I, um, I had played games before, but mostly in a hands-off sort of way, uh, or hanging out with some friends. And I always thought they were really cool and interesting, and I always really wanted to play games, but my parents were paranoid, to say the least, about their capacity to rot my brain and um, turn me into a non-functioning member of society, which ultimately they were correct about, but um, there's not much we can do about that, is there? Oh, that's how I feel. <laughs> yep, that's... I don't know how you picture me, but that's definitely how I feel like I look today. I'm not going to bother with the customization so much. A customization menu at all like this, I don't believe was ever in any any real PlayStation One game. But even even this has been carefully modified to or designed to to look appropriate. I'm not even sure what these slide. I'm not sure if these sliders even actually do anything. Okay, curbs visibly changes a little bit. I'm gonna set everything to be maximum. Oh, the tummy, you get a tummy with abdomen, that's okay. Chest. I'm not sure if that does anything. All right, let's be a brick, sh oh, let's be a brick shithouse. Which is the general ideal when you want to go into a mysterious, horrible place full of gribbly grubbly ghoul men and zombies. So yeah, I, uh, <laughs> okay. So I don't know what any of these stats do because of course I have not played uh, Bloodborne or, you know, read the paper manual that came in the the jewel case that I, I brought this game home from the, the secondhand game store in. Let's commit to the fantasy completely fully. 
I'm going to assume vitality is health, endurance is stamina, strength is attack damage, skill might be like a dexterity type thing, blood tinge could be goddamn anything. Are there magic spells? I don't know what spell I don't know what arcane does. Waste of space, cruel fate, these seem pretty accurate to me. Noble scion, military vet, professional, no. Violent past, maybe. Troubled childhood, maybe. I mean... Let's go with milk toast. Good. All signed and sealed. Now, let's begin the transfusion. Oh, don't you worry. Whatever happens, you may think it all a mere bad dream. Always good advice, really. You never really want your doctor to chuckle menacingly as you go under. I'm going to assume this is the registered nurse. You're here to perform the transfusion, right? Oh no. Are they really- <laughs> I know things are rough in the health industry at the moment, do they- But do they have to fire all the nurses? Oh, hi. It is- I'm gonna call this a spookum? A goop? A haint? A micro ghoul? Ah, you found yourself a hunter. I've managed to stay surprisingly unspoiled on what is or is not in bloodborne over the years but i do know that these little guys are uh, disproportionately helpful to how creepy they are d-pad to navigate fun fact the uh original release of the playstation did not have controllers that had analog sticks on them there was a d-pad it is it's this sort of awkward bridging point between uh the adoption of, of 3d stick movement and uh the games that preceded that ape escape was the game was released almost specifically just to encourage people to get used to using uh, two stick controls. Seek a pale blood to transcend the hunt. A device we can all use in our real lives today. I do remember playing that game as a kid as well because <clears throat> my some of my relatives had a slightly more advanced PlayStation because the PSX was the sort of original release of the of the original PlayStation and it was this enormous chunky. <laughs> Uh, sort of veined black grey box <laughs> that would squat on your TV like an aircraft hangar. It's also nice that it's got the uh... it tells you it tells you PlayStation controls, uh, controls. I'm playing this with an Xbox controller. I'm going to assume X is bottom left. Mm -hmm. L2, R2, rotate camera. R1, L1, melee attacks. And, uh... Oh, B is backstep. Or dodge roll. What are the iframes like on this? Y, nothing yet. Uh, X, which isn't X, X, nothing yet. I don't want to... <clears throat> I don't want to fight that. I've been vaguely spoiled on the beginning of Bloodborne, and I know that you get killed by the first monster that you see, and then maybe the rest of the game is a dying delusion, or something like that, but... I've always secretly felt like if I played Bloodborne, I would just commit to killing it. Pa pow Oh, I'm actually... Time to flee. Where did it go? Oh shit, there it is.
What happens if you do kill the werewolf in Bloodborne, I wonder? So I definitely remember playing um, early console games before that. I, one friend of mine, I think, had a SNES, which I played a couple times, but mostly... Um, ah, did I died. Well, now I guess I get to find out. Mostly my experience was on, was on the Sega Mega Drive, which was the UK or EU variant of the Sega... Saturn, I want to say? Or the Genesis, maybe? And... Uh, it was a delightful machine, roughly, al roughly analogous to Sega's SNES, and, uh, but I, I never had one of my own. My best friend had one, shout out to Jess if you're watching, and um, so this is the hunter's dream. Volume, by the way, for my voice and for the various ghouls and spookums. <laughs> Starting down to equip weapons, but I don't. Have, mm, I don't have any yet. Okay, so that's going to come in handy later. So thanks, but <laughs> it is not yet useful. <laughs> After taking enemy damage from enemy, is a period of time in which attacking the enemy. <laughs> I'll want to next to enemy visceral attack. <laughs> How do I scroll? Oh, there we go, scroll. Which attack the enemy in return will restore a certain amount of HP. <laughs> Shooting your firearm will also interrupt and stagger an enemy or quickly timed. <laughs> oh, that's right, you have guns instead of shields for parrying. Some weapons don't have charge attacks. <laughs> Hitting an enemy for attack will stagger them, and then I suppose you can get the. Heavy attack combo thing magic that it mentioned. I was just gonna say. It's already already red. Hold <laughs> for a powerful attack and probably charged attack, I see. Okay. <laughs> Next while manual aiming to cancel aim. <laughs> Square while manual aiming to aim precisely. L1 to aim firearm. Tap while running to jump. How do I run? Ah, like that. Just the vibes of this are so intensely nostalgic to me. For all the reasons that I've already been describing, but um. It's, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I actually remember the day I got my first games console. It was, while I'm an inveterate PC gamer nowadays and I barely ever touch consoles, patoo patoo. Um, what's this? Blood Echo Shop. Purchase items. Blood Vial. Quicksilver Bullets, Mortal Cocktails, Pebbles and a Call Beyond. And nothing else. How do I back out of this? So, oh, that's a lantern. So, yeah, I actually remember the day I got a, a PSX. It was um, I'd been I'd been clamoring at my parents for literally years at that point to get a uh, a console of my own, and they were very worried. They were very worried that um, suddenly I would I would stop doing homework ever stop working on stuff ever. Little did they know I was really highly disinclined to ever work on anything ever because of my many and varied mental problems which existed when I was a child as much as they do now that I'm an adult. Um, and games gave me a nice safe comfy out to escape those, those terrible situations in my head. But they did eventually relent and they got me a second hand PSX in like 1997, 98, something like that. 99? Anyway, um, so for a few years... The messengers offer you a trick weapon. Choose one. Trick weapons are wielded with the right hand and employed in beast hunting. <laughs> Saw cleaver or threaded cane? 
Deadly as a rigid bladed cane, also serves as a whip when split into many. The saw, effective at drawing the blood of beasts, transforms into a long cleaver that makes use of centrifugal force. Again, I never played Bloodborne, so I don't really know what the difference is, but the one Bloodborne Let's Play I, I watched a bit of a few years ago took the threaded cane, so I'm going to take the threaded cane and hope for the best. <laughs> sort of noob trap. Incidentally, I love this inventory system. I think it's been more heavily inspired by uh, the early Tomb Raider games than by any of the other um, early PlayStation games that I remember. But there were quite a few early PlayStation games that were very enamoured of the of the opportunity to just, you know, let you um, see 3D 3D models. They were so pleased of the, with the fact that they had a console that could render in 3D <laughs> that most of the menus consisted of sequences of 3D mod models for a long time. A firearm <laughs> in my left hand. Pistol or blunderbuss. Interesting that the pistol has far higher attack than a blunderbuss, which is a kind of an enormous oversized shotgun of a thing. Maybe that makes it better for parrying and this is just better for doing damage? I'm not sure, but I like the pistol. Let's take the pistol. This is probably still locked as well. Yeah, I have to talk to the doll first. How do you actually, how do you actually split it into the, into the bits? Not Y or X. Come on, come on, Wigglies. Show me, show me what you got. Aha! Awaken above ground. First floor sick room leave. Okay, so that's how I get back to the main world. So this adopted, I guess, must have adopted something more similar to the the later Dark Souls games uh, layouts, rather than having the entire world be a seamless, layered, tangled ball of string of a, of a setting. Instead, you teleport to different places around and explore between and teleport back and so on. But again, I'm just inferring from this because I haven't, I haven't played Bloodborne. An abandoned doll. Is that, was that it? Alright. I think the abandoned doll might be how you level up because FromSoft have this, this real dedication, this real desire. Perhaps it's simply simply the director, uh, Hidetaka Miyazaki. Who, who loves to have um, wayfish individuals bring out your inner power. Uh, yeah, no, you did not miss too much. You've missed 10 minutes of me rambling about being a child and how and why I haven't played Bloodborne yet. So now that I have a weapon, I should be able to kill that werewolf. Although I still haven't figured out how to open it. It's not Y, it's not X, it's not B, which is dodge. B and A together. What does A even do? Or, I mean, X. Let's interact. So, yeah, I can swing my weapon, but I can't. Hmm. It's supposed to be a trick weapon. I'm supposed to be able to crack it over. Right. Attack right hand. Let's have a save point. Oh, the, the addition of save points is extremely delightful. Everyone forgets about this nowadays. The save points are even a thing. Whoops. can't back out of this without... That's a good noise for deleting a save, I'll give them that much. Uh, what the hell is it? Oh, XA locks on, okay. Is this door still locked? Apparently yes. So, as I was saying, I, um, I'd been clamouring for years to get a games console of my own. Uh, I loved playing Sonic the Hedgehog with my, my good friend. And I, I played on N64 whenever I got the chance. Um... Okay, can I take something from this dead guy? But the, the, the really delightful thing that I'm enjoying about Bloodborne PSX so far is this absolute dedication. This is exactly what games looked like back then. And it's exactly how they sounded and felt. And even the UI design is extremely accurate. Aha, locked on. So I should be able to sidestep. Get wrecked. That makes it tough. Well, fair enough. 
Equip consumables and triangle uses consumables. Okay. Fair enough. Oh, I haven't equipped my I haven't equipped my handgun. That's what I should have done. Ah, and I have no ammunition. Fair enough. Got my first floor clinic key. I assume that's gonna be on the first floor. So I, uh, yeah, and then one day they came home with this awkward plastic bag. <laughs> uh, and they'd gone to a second-hand games shop and got me a second-hand PSX, which they didn't have, which had, if I remember correctly, three games. It had a copy of Quake 2, uh, well, the PlayStation, the original, play, the early PlayStation version of, of Quake 2, um... Which was all good to play with a controller, let me tell you. And uh, also a copy of Gran Turismo 2, which I hated and never played. And a copy of Crash Bandicoot, which was... It was Crash Bandicoot 2, actually. Yeah, so they, ca they came with those three games. And I had a fantastic time with Crash Bandicoot. Never got very far in Quake, though. In fact, I don't think I ever beat Quake 2 until I came back to it last year when I just felt like playing a retro shooter and zipped through the whole thing in like a day. <laughs> so I, um... Well, see, Gran Turismo I don't like because it's realist racing games. I like kart racing games. And I also did not like Gran Turismo because it was just hard for a child because it was relatively simulationist compared to everything else I'd ever played. Uh, but also to this day, um, in all honesty, racing games are like the one kind of game I cannot play. I've never been able to do do well at racing games. Um, I will, you know, happily beat Sekiro multiple times in a row. I will happily, you know, zip through like difficult platformers or well, really difficult. So I need a key from somewhere, and I haven't seen a way to get a key from somewhere yet. <laughs> Um, oh, I need to equip it. Yeah, that's very of its era as well, actually. Ring. First floor clinic. Okay, let's put it on here. How do I switch between quick items? Well, not like that. That uses them. Um, let's attack. Let's dodge. It's gonna be a way to switch between quick items quickly, right? Obviously, definitionally. Incidentally, I am interested to see how quickly it's gonna take for um, this game to get massively, monumentally, and irrevocably slapped to shit by uh, DMCA ta takedowns, because it just just is. <laughs> Even if it's all handmade, even if it's all completely created from, from the ground up. It is just Bloodborne again, as, I, as far as I understand it. And it's delightful. And it deserves uh, vast amounts of praise. And uh, the horrible machineries of um, capital will, will, will destroy it. Like, it destroys all art. So... Yeah, my parents my parents brought this, this machine home and, and we plugged it in and I spent... The rest of the day, I think. Well, I'm, for like an hour. My parents wouldn't let me play it for more than an hour or so because they were, rightly, worried it would eat my brain. And um, the fact that I am now attempting to be a professional gaming YouTuber and streamer probably does go so far as to show that they may have been right. Anyway, we plugged it in and I played it. And they, uh, they maintained that uh, Quake was too scary for me and I was not allowed to play Quake. Or Quake 2, rather, which is the... <laughs> of the Quake games, it's the less scary one. Um, so I was I was not allowed to play Quake 2 uh, for a while. Only my dad was allowed to play that, and then he never did. And um, But quickly that relax uh, restriction was relaxed, and I was allowed to play Quake 2, but only when my little brothers weren't around, who were maybe five? No, they couldn't have been five, because then I'd have been ten. They're five years younger than me, and this was definitely in the 90s, because... I got a PC in like 2001, at which point I became a PC gamer forever. <laughs> That's not true. I played consoles for a long, long time alongside the PC, but like 
my love for PC games is it you know it dates it dates back very far and it boils down to some really really amazing games circa 2001 that I still love today and go back and play many times and will eventually do let's plays of probably that was blocked from this side that one got me a transfusiony doodad I don't see anything else around here I guess I have to move on uh, yeah so um, uh, I was allowed to play Quake, and then my my smaller children, my smaller brothers, were not allowed to be in the room while I played it. I had to wait for them to go to bed, and then play it on the very narrow window between then and my own bedtime. <laughs> um, I, it seems absurd to me nowadays, really, because they were not particularly scary games. <laughs> But yeah, and then I played a ton of PlayStation games. Not nearly as many as I wanted to, because I could never afford very many games. Um, and in fact, there are a lot of there are a lot of games that I remember fondly, which I never actually played. I just played bits of demo discs. <laughs> I actually still have a collection of about seven PlayStation One demo discs that I got from official PlayStation magazine over the years. No stats are listed for these, I'm just going to assume that the rumpled hat is better than whatever I was wearing before. And look how dapper and stylish I am now. Delightful. But yeah, so like, you know, there were a lot of very classic <laughs> feels to these things. L1 attack with left hand firearms use quicksilver bullets, which I don't have any of. Oh, huh, well that problem didn't last long. And I also, uh... I think the most sort of ps one of the PS1 games I played was probably Silent Bomber, which is... I want to call it a cult classic now, except that it's not... N n not enough people played it for it to be a, a cult classic. Which was about a... Uh, a child soldier grown up in the future space war who has doodads on his arms that throw bombs out. It was like a... It was completely unrelated to Bomberman, but it was almost like a dark, gritty reboot of Bomberman. And so, you know, you, you go around and there are a lot of really inventive enemy designs, a lot of really fun zones, and um, you, were hot, you, were, you were with your allies hot dropped onto the, the surface of a, an, of a bad guy's spaceship and you had to go through many, many levels fighting your way to the top. And there was, there was drama, there were character, you know, heel turns and face turns and so on as you, your fraught little group of, of freedom fighters tried to tried to take down a Death Star, basically. It was it actually was kind of Star Wars-y now that I think about it. Anyway, that's a different game. <laughs> the other the other PS1 game I remember very fondly is Grandia, which was possibly my first exposure to a... It's like, all your fault! Oh shit, it's my away! fault. Away! I do not wish to be put on fire, thanks. I wonder what's my fault. Locked. I get the feeling there's going to be a lot of locked doors today. Locked, locked by device, sealed by some power. I mean, the drama of locked doors and their various openings is of course one of the long-lasting tensions in video games as a medium. Oh, these guys look like they might be a threat. Can I? Aha. I don't seem to be able to switch. Oh, there we go. This is a damn turn. We good, or are you going to attack? Oh, he's attacking. Candy beat. Help me! Oh, I need to get used to dodging. Beast. A FromSoft game? No, this isn't a FromSoft game. Oh no, you're making fun. <laughs> so, uh, oh, hang on, is that inventory stats and system? Okay, no. What was I talking about? God, I'm so tired. This probably won't be a very long stream today, although I would like to pick up and continue this game another day. I think I may have damaged my throat, uh, which is something I've already said. 
Molotov cocktails, those should come in handy. I'm going to save those for a boss because I'm probably going to do really badly. Uh... I feel like I should be talking about, you know, what Bloodborne is and what it does and what Bloodborne's like, but I really can't speak to that, having been denied the opportunity to play it. I really, I, I don't know who gains from it not being brought to PC. Um, the, the, the presence of the Dark Souls games on PC have shown that there is a huge audience for Soulsborne experiences on PC. Um, it's been clamoured for, it's been desired across the board by a ton of people for a really long time and I just I don't I don't see the economic incentive if the desire is to get people to buy playstations then fair enough but nobody's buying playstation 3s for demon souls nobody's buying playstation 4s for uh, bloodborne because they're obsolete now essentially and nobody could afford well I couldn't afford to buy them for the sake of yeah all right shush I'll talk about you later I certainly couldn't afford to buy a console just to play one game. In fact, as, like, you know, like, the pricing of gaming hasn't gone up crazily, but when you can consider the combination of inflation with, um, oops, with sinking, sinking, uh, costs and rises in costs of living, basically people are a lot poorer now, on average, than they used to be. No one can afford consoles for just one game anymore. There's there's no such thing as a killer app anymore. There is no there is no sufficiently good Halo that will get you to buy a, an Xbox. And certainly not Halo Infinite. It's a good spooky noise though. Ooh, you must be a hunter, and not one from around here either. I'm Gilbert, a fellow outsider. You must have had a fine time of it. Yarnum has a special way of treating guests. Well, I don't think I could stand if I wanted to, but I'm willing to help if there's anything that can be done. Does he have the switch for that door in his house? So yeah, after that point, you know, I... I remember playing more games than I actually have, but I still have most of my old PlayStation 1 games. Uh, I have a big packet and a PlayStation 2 that I can play them on. Unfortunately, some went missing over the years. I still suspect my brother of having sold a couple of them on the sly when he thought we weren't, you know, using them. Um, I definitely miss my copy of Moho, which was also a very PlayStation 1 game. Which was a sort of a battle arena game. Um with a mix of combat and platforming where you play a cyborg or a robot or something in, in, in a miserable dystopian far future where, where criminal robots have their legs removed and replaced with rolling balls <laughs> and are then forced to battle to the death in gladiatorial combats um, or gladiatorial platforming challenges as the case may be. It's a nice touch that these level transitions have been added as you try and get through these areas which I assume in Bloodborne are all seamlessly one area, but of course in Bloodborne PSX, it would be, uh, it would not match the verisimilitude of the games of the era if you could. Oh, this guy's having a time of it. Where is the hitbox on these attacks? I went all the way around behind. And, uh, yeah, I don't even remember what I was saying. Oh, yeah, of course. The, there's no way that a PlayStation could, uh, a PSX could have, could have loaded this many, this many games into, uh, this many games, this many areas, these, these large spaces into memory at once, and obviously it would have to be chopped up with level transitions. I don't see why I shouldn't, I couldn't just leave. It seems like the the combat system has been will have been like uh, eased up a little bit, I guess you could say. Help me! Oh God! I think 
you just have to be standing behind someone to get a backstab benefit. There's no dedicated backstab animations. I'm pretty sure that's not the case in Bloodborne, but again, I ain't played it. But, um... I do wonder sometimes if there is... If there is a, a benefit to being overly literal in one's, like, resurrected retro gaming elements, there's always been these desires to recreate games exactly as they were or would have been back when when the era that you were that you're referencing created them and um nice gargle on this guy and uh, but i think that there is a there is a a passage in pretty much all art forms where early on the art form is highly limited by its its structure by its form Early photography required the subject to be motionless for a long time, and those limitations of the medium leave various hallmarks, you know. Photography, film, even painting. All of these things had... all of these uh, media had structural limitations. As the technology moves on, those limitations are slowly lifted, and then the state of the medium to, uh, moves on. But then... You also... Oh, nice. Can I, is that even usable in this version of the game? Uh, but then you also... Then uh, a nostalgia for how things used to look comes back around and you get the bullet trans... Oh, that'll make... That makes bullets out of blood. A weird idea, if you ask me. I still need to know how to switch quick slots. Uh, and so yeah, after having after having transcended the limitations of the medium, the unique look and aesthetics and vibes of that medium are a, a nostalgia is developed for them, and then they are brought back uh, as a component of this. And obviously, games are my medium, so I'm most qualified to talk about games. Um, and I think it's very noticeable in games because you see this nostalgia for. Oops. Games that could never have been created in the times when the nostalgia from which... Oh god, I'm so tired today. Essentially, a nostalgia arrives and... I have a... <clears throat> I have a thing I'm trying to say and I can't get it to come out properly. I am. I guess I am more tired than I thought. So... Yeah, as as we move on, the those essentially those limitations are brought back in by people who, who for whom the nostalgia of the the look of the thing is strong. But that look was dictated by the limitations of the medium. And so having transcended the limitations of that medium, you are then able to create something that looks and feels but does not have the the same limitations. So it would be perfectly possible to create a Bloodborne PSX that did not have loading screens between the areas. And it would probably still have the vibes or that had loading screens between larger areas, uh, but not all of the areas. Is this where we first came in? I think it is. The ladder. Uh, yeah, there's the ladder. Uh, 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 So, on top of all of that, uh, I think it's interesting that in games in particular, it's true in it's true in all media where this occurs, but in games in particular, there's a desire to exactly ape the forms of the old thing, rather than rather than figuring out what made the old thing feel special, which of those limitations were integral to the feel, and which merely caused it to look and feel in a certain way, even when those restrictions are later removed. Uh, and then adopt the parts that are necessary and discard the parts that are not. <clears throat> and I think I think games and the nostalgia of games are particularly uh, vulnerable to this brain mistake, this this possible brain mistake that one might make. Um, anyway, I have said I have said this theory of like artistic development before in the past. <laughs> Uh, on in Let's Plays and on other streams, perhaps, but 
I, uh, I'm not really, you know, I'm having a bit of a time of it today, much like these fellows. <laughs> You'll mess up my brain? I'd like to see you fucking try. Oh, I'm out of bullets. I barely have any brain left to mess up, are you kidding? Is that- is that a line from the original Bloodborne? Are these all lines stripped from Bloodborne that have been bit crushed down? Because if so, I'll mess up your brain is the fucking best one I've ever heard in a game. And if not, what is the genius of this dev who's added this to the game? Because that helps the vibes immeasurably. I'm starting to get the hang of not taking any hits in combat, so that's good. I mean, shooting people from a distance away is definitely a good way to avoid getting hit in combat. Um, as the industrialization of warfare in the uh, 1800s definitely proved to everybody. So, we've definitely been through this area before. So we can head back around and down. But yeah, so... Um, we see this we see this this trend in in pretty much all all art forms we see this in music you know i'm going probably going to talk at length and unstoppably uh, during my up upcoming paradise killer let's play about the ways that um there's a there's a deep nostalgia and there's this particular trend that i've just been talking about present in the genres genres like synthwave genres like future funk genres like uh, vaporwave especially and in fact I think vaporwave is one of the most interesting genres of like this kind of nostalgia revival music of recent years simply because it is taking one step further this kind of like structural limitation idea and going with it to the point of actually building something new out of things that were never supposed to be part of an artistic medium in the first place almost um which is not something that's never been done before, but it is something that is to be lauded when it happens. And, um, yeah, so, like, this is definitely true in the case of, of games more visibly and more commonly than other mediums. Possibly because it's such, such a young medium, and yet it's evolved faster than almost any other medium, simply because we're in the fucking late game end stages of acceleration up to the fucking end of the world i guess but the um everything moves a lot faster now than it ever did before there's just been an exponential increase in the speed of everything over the past hundred years and um given that hi Bina. nice to see that this is catching on <laughs> uh, you give permission once and then it's there forever so what the hell was I talking about? Oh right, yeah, so this is especially noticeable in games because it's such a fast-moving medium and such a recently started medium. Um, you know, you can watch you can watch the way that retro gaming has changed over, over the last, let's say, 20 years. Retro gaming kicked off with a nostalgia for arcade games of the 1970s. Um, and then very rapidly moved into the earliest home console games with the sort of Amiga vibes. You know, 8-bit games. Um, no, fucking black screen with, like, four pixels on it. That kind of game. And that nostalgia um, was entirely valid for the people who experienced it, but I never understood it. Partly because I never grew up through that, but also partly because I think those games were just fucking boring. I have gone back and tried to play games from those eras. I have played retro games aping those eras, and they're very simple, you know, mazes or very simple shmups. There's not a lot of interest or cleverness to them. There's not a lot to do. There's not a lot that the medium could, was capable of achieving at all at the time. So then, you know, all the way through, you know, the early days of the of retro gaming, that's what pe appealed to people. But then very quickly, retro gaming became nostalgic for the 80s, the late 80s and the early 90s. And people were nostalgic for, you know, 16-bit platformers and um, RPGs. And, you know, there was a vast flood of uh, deeply nostalgic 
like 16-bit or 8-bit platformers on um, in the in the huge indie games boom of recent years. And one of the interesting things about that is it's taking things that were primarily console in cons in 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 access and applying them to the PC because the indie games movement has always been very highly PC focused because most developers simply oh I didn't know I could break these <laughs> most developers uh, at the time at least couldn't stand the idea of having indie games available on their console services they love walled gardens because all capitalists love walled gardens um, as I'm sure we all know so um, that meant that you you had people playing on PC games that were deeply nostalgic for styles of games that had never really existed on PC previously. And um, and yeah, that, that wave of, of you know, 16-bit style platformers with the with the retro trip to music uh, and, you know, bright, colourful um, aesthetics, you know, caught on and then moved on very quickly. I think my favourite of those was definitely uh, Shovel Knight, which no, I, I remember very fondly. Um, I was really, really good. But there were a ton of them. And so what really, really deeply appeals to me now about retro gaming and like nostalgic games is that that very, very fast cycle has now reached the point of attempting to find what was valuable about the aesthetics of very early 3D games. We have we have examined and gone through, you know, what did the limitations of pre-3D games have and how did those limitations impact how they looked and felt? And how can we bring how those looked and felt into the modern era and how can we pull the good stuff out and it, get rid of the frustrating limitations? Having... Is he talking to me? You're talking to me? <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. They didn't hear me smash a box. These guys are deaf as hell. They probably all are when we're... Maybe the disease that they have infects them, but... Infects their ability to hear. That's probably another thing. I don't see why it wouldn't be. These guys look like they might be, like they might be werewolf type guys. And I was attacked by a werewolf previously. Anyway, so I think the reason why this is so deeply interesting to me personally is twofold. One, it's the era of gaming I am most heavily nostalgic for. Um, well, console gaming. In terms of PC gaming, I am also very heavily nostalgic for this era and the eras after it. I love lurid old fantasy games. I love Might, might and Magics and so on. Um, but this was the this turning point the very earliest steps of full 3d games that's where i think um there's a lot of interest to discover and pull out <laughs> the timing of that wow um so yeah what the hell was i saying right this the structural limitations of you know 16-bit platformer is primarily artistic um if you can only have 16 pixels then there's only a certain number of ways that your your figures can look there's only a certain number of ways you can tile environments and so on so then those same structural limitations are carried over into 3d games because the renderer can only support so much draw distance or so much uh, I don't think I'm ever going to pull off uh, an interruption. Oops. <laughs> I mean, the addition of load zones that were not present in the original game that has been demade does it lead to some interesting tactical considerations, I now realise. Hmm. Anyway, uh, I just think that the structural limitations of this era of games are that much more obvious, because you can make a 16-bit platformer now, transcend all of its limitations, and it won't look that much different. It's just that, you know, they're actually doing clever things behind the scenes, or it's able to render that much more stuff. So, 
the look of these ones is so clumsy and was such a, a thing to be derided of the era. Games of the 3D games of the 90s were all about the acceleration of the technology. It was all about how many more polygons we could render, how much more realistic we could make it, how much smoother everything could be. Um, and games really kind of gained their sort of mad technologist rush at that point and the obsession that games designers have had with, you know, focusing on improving the looks. And um, that means that now that we've reached this point where we can actually look back and assess and figure out, actually, the limitations of that medium made these games look a certain way. And the fact that they look that certain way is not a bad thing. It has aesthetic qualities all of its own. And so we can detach those aesthetic, quali uh, aesthetic qualities from their, um, their, their structural limitations that caused them to come into existence in the first place. Ouch. And having done that, we can then make new things that evoke that feel and can use it for the purposes that it was not used for originally because originally it was mandatory by the nature of the, the machine itself. See, that's an interesting point, the uh, the inclusion of the loading uh, that Bina has made, because the inclusion of the loading screens for the benefit of evoking the same vibes and then letting you skip them is an interesting interesting way to get around the thing I was saying earlier about the, the awkwardness and difficulty of including the structural limitations that you don't need to include, because a lot of these didn't need to be included. Um, and the real trick is figuring out which ones you can and can't get rid of without losing the vibes. So yeah, half of it is because these games took place at a very, very interesting point in the technological development of games. The the flip over from primarily 2D to primarily 3D spaces. And um, the other reason is, of course, as I was saying earlier, that this is the sort of one of the two main areas of gaming that I am and have been nostalgic for for a long time. Um, as I was saying earlier, I still have all my, most of my old PS1 games, apart from the ones that mysteriously disappeared. I, I still remember what my, my PSX looked like. In fact, I remember that my friend eventually... <laughs> my aforementioned friend who had the uh, Mega Drive and uh, N64 that we used to play together on um, eventually got a PlayStation, and it was the PS1, which had a very different vibe. If the, if the PSX looked very 90s, and it did because it was a rectangular grey box with cooling veins on the side, it looked extremely chunky and 90s then the PS1, the actual PS1, which a lot of people don't remember, or they mix up the two, or they don't really track the difference or whatever, um, it looked um, astonishingly 2002. And um, one of the things that really amuses me about the fact that the mid-90s, early, early 3D game uh, aesthetic is catching on in games at the moment, is that in other forms of art, especially in other forms of digital art, oh nice, double kill, we've just gotten past that. We've just got past that and started to move into being extremely nostalgic about, about the early and mid 2000s in, you know, there's aesthetic posts all over the internet uh, about, you know, inflatable bubble chairs and, you know, rave flyers and album covers and so on for dance tracks with, like, a very, very, very specific aesthetic that I don't really know how to describe, but that I deeply love. Um, and it is that kind of like... Early, early... Oh, there must be something down here. Early zero zeros era stuff. So, at the point where... Actually, now that I think about it, when did 3D games catch on in the early PlayStation days? It wouldn't have been in the mid-90s, because... Uh, the Sega Mega Drive only came out in 1993, and that couldn't render 3D. So it was 95 or 96, maybe, that the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn came out? Or was that even later? I remember a lot of this stuff as being earlier than it actually was, uh, to some extent. 
So maybe I was older than I was saying earlier, uh, when I first got a console. Ha! <laughs> that's a pretty, that's a pretty, uh, cute story. I remember my brothers and I each had one memory card each to store our save games on. Not at the start, but like, that's how it ended up shaking out. I think I even... I even still have those memory cards because I can plug them into my PS2. <laughs> I'm going in circles here. I, I, I feel like I've missed somewhere. I've missed an access somewhere to get to another area. I found, I found two bonfires or bonfire equivalents. And now I just keep heading back in a loop. Did I come down this way previously? But one of the weirdest things about having so much nostalgia for this era and remembering so much of it so well, but so in such a fragmentary fashion, is that I remember playing a lot more games than look that looked like this than I actually did, and I could not name half of them. Um, you know, I I didn't play Vagrant Story, but Vagrant Story looked like this. I it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Burn. Burn. You only ever hear Cockney accents in games on, um, violent Victorian people or on, um, World War Two soldiers. That's it. Those are the- Hey, we thought put that back up again. No, okay, it's just endlessly interactable, I guess. Something tells me that the- that is relevant in some way. Is that the front of a cathedral? It's quite hard to tell. I think the other... The main other deeply nost... Did I, uh, maybe I didn't go over that way, that might be it. The main other deeply nostalgic for the PS1 era game I've played that I really enjoy... Is... <laughs> I love the juxtaposition of those two comments, and I, I agree with both of them. We definitely need to remember cheery, untrustworthy, but ultimately good-hearted street urchins, but we do also need to remember that probably Cockney accents on cute anime waifus with big boing boings would also at least be an aesthetic that we could experiment with. Oh, hang on, I bet I've gained one insight, right? And I bet that means this place has changed. That's why I can talk to, speaking of waifus, Hello, this. Good hunter. I am a doll. Here in this dream to look after you, honorable hunter, pursue the echoes of blood, and I will channel them into your strength. You will hunt beasts, and I will be here for you to embolden your sickly spirit. Did you speak to German? He was a hunter long, long ago but now serves only to advise them. He is obscure, unseen in the dreaming world. Still, he stays here in this dream. Such is his purpose. Very well. Let the echoes become your strength. Let me stand close. Now shut your eyes. So I still don't know what any of the stats do, but I guess this is a way to find out. Looks like vitality increases strength and hit points, endurance increases stamina, defense and resistance, strength will get me attack, melee attack, skill gets me also melee attack, blood tinge eventually increases my ranged attack, but I don't know what blood tinge does, and arcane does nothing whatsoever. At least in terms of my stats. Again, I have not played bloodborne at all so i don't actually know uh i don't know what any of this does or what it means so oh i can't afford to level up twice i can't afford to level up twice that sucks now that I have some insight. It says, oh, it literally is one on it, so I need one insight to open this door. That makes sense. 
As I understand it, Bloodborne has a mechanic of this kind of like permanent, it, it's a bit like humanity in the Dark Souls games, except maybe it's permanent. And as your insight grows, you are able to see things that you couldn't previously see. It's essentially your understanding of the true nature of the world as befits the uh, cosmic horror of uh, elements of the setting. You gain insight into the true nature of reality and your illusions are stripped away and discover that horrible things have been here amongst us all along, such as this old man. Aha! You must be the new hunter. Welcome to the hunter's dream. This will be your home for now. I am... Gehrman. Friend to you, hunters. You're sure to be in a fine haze about now, but don't think too hard about all of this. Just go out and kill a few beasts. It's for your own good. You know, it's just what hunters do. You'll get used to it. That's kind of an interesting meta interaction with the kind of wider narratives of, you know, Soulsborne type games. Oh, I can unlock some Aha! That's how you do it. Wait, did that say I do it in the menu? Can I upgrade my weapon? Bloodstone requirement. Right, fair enough. I need bloodstones. I mean, I need bloodstones in real life too. Don't we all need bloodstones? Very important part of the everyday life of the average human being. I think about it there is one more full 3d playstation game this reminds me of it came it its visuals were a fair bit more advanced but that's uh, a certain uh, sort of pokemon-esque game of collecting monsters which is called jade cocoon which i which i love very much and my producer is now waggling at me in a way that implies that she also enjoyed very much <laughs> which um was a really weird evocative game with a lot of sort of Ghibli-esque art in the cutscenes and then primitive 3D models in the actual game. Right, I can buy I can buy bullets to put in my gun to shoot people. Molotovs I have. Pebbles I don't have. Quite thrilling, apparently, to throw them at people. Much like in real life. Special blood used in ministration restores oh wait no we know that. Once a patient has had their blood ministers is a unique but common treatment in Yarnum. How do I leave? I can't... I can't scroll this, so I don't know how to see what it says. I don't... No, I don't want to buy this. Because it doesn't... Hmm. I probably should buy some bullets, if nothing else. These are expensive, wow. It's like 15% of a level up to buy one bullet. Hmm. I'm clearly not utilising them correctly. Anyway, so uh, much like early PlayStation games, this doesn't actually have 3D sticks that you can use to move the camera or the character. Uh, it's D-pad movement only, and you use L and, uh, the left and right triggers to... Oh, can I open this? <laughs> no, can't do anything. Left and right triggers to uh, move the camera. You know, again, I haven't played Bloodborne, so I don't know what it looks like in Bloodborne, but this this other realm, this misty place with distant stone pillars reaching off to the horizon, um, I can see why, if that's present in that form in the original game, Bloodborne, then I can see why people obsessively try to connect Bloodborne to the setting of Dark Souls. I think that's, I still think that's misguided, and there's just a sort of a shared thematic element, these underpinnings of reality. But, um... It does look vaguely similar to the... Where is the... Oh, it's this guy. That's what I need. It does look similar to the uh, arch trees that, are, that hold up the substrate of the world in, in Dark Souls. Anyway, I 
probably had more stuff I was going to say, but I've kind of forgotten what all of it is. But my throat is starting to hurt pretty badly. So I'm going to save and quit, and that's going to be probably all we do tonight. But I would like to pick this up again in a few days with my next stream. So that's going to be all for today. Thank you all for watching. I'm sorry that this was a really short one, but... Um, you know, I went for three hours the other day and burnt my voice out, so I do have to be slightly careful. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. If you haven't done already done so, go check out my YouTube channel. Oh shit, there's a way down. No, wait, that's how we climbed up here. <laughs> uh, check out my YouTube channel. Thank you to my Patreon patrons and anyone who donates to me on Ko-fi. If you want to do that, you can do those on the places that I just said. And also, if you would like pings about when my next streams are going to be, feel free to join my Discord server, which exists for that purpose. And I've just realised I haven't actually added to my Twitch page, but you can find it on uh, on on Twitter, I guess, right now. <laughs> I'm sure you can find it if you want it, or just message me if you don't have it. Anyway, that's going to be all for today. Thank you for joining me.